Is creativity special? So creativity is a relatively modern concept. The Greeks didn't really uh, sort of understand it. Uh, when they had a Greek play, they imagined that that was just uh, documenting the human condition. And if they designed a trireme, that was just an inevitable solid, just like a Pythagorean solid. But around the Renaissance time, we started to accept that creativity and invention was like a, a, a thing, right? And often uh, Leonardo da Vinci is credited as the first inventor. Uh, but in uh, 1474, uh, Venice en enacted a, a, a patent act, the first patent act in the world. And so there were quite a, quite a lot of inventors around at that time. And then over the next few centuries, invention really took off, or at least the documentation of invention. And we ended up with the postal system, and communications, and flight, and computers with touch screens, which I was quite involved in, and then the World Wide Web, and all the things that have kind of accelerated from there. But what I want to ask is really, is it, is it really a special thing, this creativity thing? Or is it just something kind of, uh, sort of ordinary? Could you automate it? Uh, you know, is it a mechanistic thing? And that's a sort of similar question, it's a sort of dual question, with, with whether you could sort of simulate reality. You know, if you could simulate reality on a computer, then um, you could sort of simulate creativity, because creativity is just part of what we do. So I've got a bit, bit of an admission to make. Um, I've actually simulated this half of the audience, okay? So you're all simulated, uh, actually on a largest computer over the, my laptop, and you're all real, okay? And we've, we, we've projected a hard light hologram of all these people here, so not freak you out. So that's why it doesn't look empty. And by the way, just before any of you get any kind of weird ideas, all the usual rules of law, like if you commit a crime, you'll go to jail in the simulation for the rest of your life. So no running amok and kind of, you know, doing nutty things. And, uh, oh, of course, and then the, the problem is, um, I set the projection up earlier. I, I wasn't quite sure which way around the room would be. So actually, you might be the simulation, you might be real, okay? And the question then is, if you're sitting there wondering whether you're, you know, whether you're really doing things for real, how would you test it? How would you know whether you were something that was mechanical, just through the motions uh, of, of creating something, or whether you were a real thing, really being creative? So a kind of good analogy is, if I said to you that if you're real, right, you can run up against the wall and do a handstand, but if you're, un, you know, if you're simulated, you can't, you just get up, run up against the wall, do a handstand, or right? okay, I can real. And this is the sort of question about um, how, how can you tell something that's automatic and something that is uh, sort of creative? And the question of whether things are all kind of automatic uh, was a question that uh, bothered mathematicians at the turn of the last century. And this chap called uh, David Hilbert asked the question whether everything that we have is, could, could just be simulated by a computer or simulated mathematically. And two people answered that question. A chap called Kurt Gödel, whose proof is quite complicated, and a chap called Alan Turing. Now, we all understand Alan Turing because, of course, he invented the computer as creating that proof, and we all use the computers every day. And so his uh, thought was that when we go through some mechanical process, you know, like long multiplication, which we all uh, learned at school. We write out uh, the numbers in a particular format, and then we add them all up, and we carry, and so on. And without any thought, without any creativity or intuition, we just go through the process. And he said, well, you could imagine this as laid out as, sort of, uh, as a tape, as, an, as uh, a se sequence of numbers. And you could then generalize this, and you could do all sorts of things with it. So, for example, you could decide, should I fall in love with this person or not? And that would be just a sequence of processes, right? Should I fall in love with this person? Yes or no? It's a decision problem. But there's a problem with decision problems, because you could say, well, let me, should, should I fall in, this with, uh, in love with this person? And you could be waiting for the, re the result to come out. And of course, the thing could get stuck in a loop. It could get you know, it could blue screen or whatever, and you'd never get the answer. You'd never know whether you were supposed to do it or not. 
And so Turing had this kind of really clever insight, which he said that if you knew if a process was going to stop or not, that would give you immense power. Because what you could do is you could put some program in and some input, and if you knew whether it was going to stop or not, you would know the answer to many puzzles. So you could, for example, put a program in and say, will this stock go up tomorrow? And you could put in, you know, Apple or whatever. And if the thing halts, you know it's going to go up. And if it doesn't, it's going to go, well, it's not going to do anything, right? And you could do that with almost any question you imagined. Uh, and this was, a, this was a puzzle, actually. If you watch the movie, um, The Imitation Game, this is this kind of uh, Denison. He comes in and he says, you're that clever chap from Cambridge that solve a puzzle that's so complicated you can't even pronounce it, which is the Einschuldigungs problem. Uh, and that's whether you can make anything halt. So Alan Turing then looked at this and said, well, can you solve any problem mechanically? He said, well, if you could solve any problem mechanically, you could actually take the halting problem itself and see whether that stopped. And it actually turns out it's a bit like uh, this sentence is a lie. Right, so if this sentence is a lie, is that true? Well, if it's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. And your head explodes, right? So he said, if you take the halting problem and you apply it to itself, you also get a paradox. And any time a mathematician gets a paradox, it means the thing can't be true. So you trace back and say, OK, well, unfortunately, faults can't exist. So what Turing had done is to say that some things are not solvable by a computer. But this is a, bit of a, a so what problem. So what? Some things are not solved by a computer, but many things are. We do our Excel expenses, we do our word processes, lots and lots of things are solved. What we really, really want to do is to be able to tell whether one picture, one piece of artistic creativity, is automatic, like the one on the left, hint, or one piece is, is a true piece of human creativity. And this is quite a difficult problem to solve. And it's really, unfortunately, I think, impossible to do for something like art. Because what I would need to do is I'd need to take your brain and freeze it, dissect it, read out all the rules, and then demonstrate the piece of art on the right had been created by extending those rules in some way, in some creative way. And we just can't, can't cut people's heads open in that way yet. Um, maybe, maybe soon. Um, but the one place that you can do it is in mathematical creativity. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of mathematical problems around that we could kind of think about. But a good one to think about is Fermat's last theorem. So Pierre Fermat was a mathematician who lived in the 15th, 16th century. And he did mathematical puzzles for, for fun. He was actually a lawyer for his job. And of course, there's no internet TV, so you had to do kind of, you know, something to keep, you, keep yourself interested in the evening. And he had a, an old book from antiquity um, called uh, Arithmetica. And he would go through all the puzzles in that. It was all things that were left by Pythagoras and so on. And he would solve these puzzles. And in the margin of, the, of his book, you would say, oh, well, what you would do is you just kind of take A and B and you, you do this trick and, and you know, it, it'll be fairly obvious how you solve it. And when he died, his son took that book and he published that book. And then mathematicians for the next 70-odd you know, years would go through the book trying to repeat all of the, the puzzles that Fermat said he'd solved. And then at the end of that sort of period, there was one puzzle left. And cheekily, Fermat had put that he had a cunning proof of this puzzle, but it wouldn't fit in the margin of his book. And it's a very simple puzzle, right? And the puzzle is, uh, if you remember uh, three, four, five triangles from school, probably you either remember them or you remember them with fear. But anyway, um, three squared plus four squared equals five squared. And there are actually an infinite number of whole number solutions to that, right? All of these you know, plotted out here. And Fermat said, there are no solutions if you do a cube or a fourth power or any other power. There's absolutely no other solutions. And that was his, and he said he had a proof for it. And that was his theory. That's Fermat's last theory. And the interesting question then that Roger Penrose asked in, in his book was, you know, if these problems are solved by human beings, right, does that mean 
that is specially creative in some way. The problem, though, is that at the time that, that Roger wrote his book, we didn't really know whether uh, Fermat's last theorem was uh, provable. It hadn't been proven at the time. And we also didn't know whether it was uh, accessible by a computer. But in uh, 1982, a chap called Matievich, who's a um, Russian mathematician, showed that finding a solution to Fermat's last theorem is part of non-computable mathematics. So that means that if you could find it, you'd be able to solve the halting problem. And we already just proved to ourselves you can't solve the halting problem. So that meant that Fermat's last theorem is not solvable in a mechanical way. And then Andrew Wiles, in 1995, solved it. So we've got a paradox. So we've proven the unprovable, right? Something that shouldn't be possible to solve, if you're a machine, had been solved. And the only answer that I think you can reasonably give is that Andrew Wiles is not a computer, right? <laughs> He's not a machine, OK? Um, what that means is that creativity is special, right? That a human being, when they're creative, and I think that that generalizes to all sorts of creation that we do, in terms of you know, art and, and literature and you know, music or composition and so on, I think all of those, fortunately, I can't prove that mathematically, but we can at least do it for all the sort of mathematical puzzles that we have. So creativity is special. And then the interesting thing about creativity being special is that it implies that our universe is special as well. Because Andrew Wiles is software running on the hardware of the universe. So if Andrew Wiles is able to solve non-computable puzzles, our universe must be non-computable. And therefore, it's not being created by a computer. And therefore, none of your, you are simulated. You're all for real.